when Mingri and the army to conquer Burma left Yunnan, the Qinlong Emperor thought he could rest his case regarding the insulin Burmese. The victory at Gothic Gorge was hardly surprising. After all, who could withstand the might of the Eight Banner Armies? There were news about the stubborn Kantung Fort. Even then, with Mingri so close to the Burmese capital, it was only a matter of time before the war was over. Then for weeks, the Qing court heard nothing. And the news finally came. Out of the 50,000 strong Bannerman army, less than half that number returned with Mingri's queue in their hands. Shocked and furious, the Jinlong Emperor blamed Er Er Dunke, the Northern Army commander, for failing to support Mingri as planned and had him sliced to death. Many Qing officials had been against the war. It held very little strategic and economic value, and it was not an existential threat to the Qing Empire. Now, it was not only a wasted effort, but a costly one. The Emperor turned to one of his most trusted advisors, the Grand Chief Counselor Fu Hung, who was also Mingri's uncle. In the 1750s, Fu Hung had been one of the few senior officials who had fully backed the Emperor's decision to eliminate the Junggar Mongols. On the 14th of April, 1768, the Imperial Court announced the death of Mingri and the appointment of Fu Hung as the new commander of the Burma campaign. A number of veteran generals were appointed as his deputies. Among them was a veteran of Mingri's expedition, Wu Gui, who would later be instrumental in putting down major uprisings against the Qing. Now, the top tier of the Qing military establishment was prepared for a final showdown with the Burmese. Before any fighting resumed, some on the Qing side sent out peace envoys to the Kongbang royal court. The war had disrupted the essential trade route in Yunnan and many merchants were complaining about the pointlessness of the war. The Burmese too were receptive of diplomacy, given their preoccupation on many other fronts. The emperor, however, encouraged by Fu Hung, made it clear that unless it was a full surrender, there would be no compromise. After three military humiliations, the dignity of the state demanded it. The Jinlong Emperor was now determined to punish the Kongbong court severely and establish direct Qing rule over all Burmese possessions. Emissaries were sent to Siam, Lao and Manipur, informing them of the Chinese ambition and seeking alliance. Intelligence agents were also sent to the Chinese communities in Burma. A massive force was assembled in Yunnan. The numbers had horrified the Burmese so much that the chronicles recorded that it was over half a million. The Qing reports, however, gave the figure to be around 60,000 strong, consisting of the troops from the Eight Banner Armies, the Green Standard Army, and Yunnanese militia. Fu Hung arrived in Yunnan in April 1769 to take command. He studied the past Ming Dynasty and Mongol expeditions to form his battle plan. The invasion would consist of three armies. Burmese guerrilla attacks had left a deep impression on the Qing and thus the plan was determined to avoid the route through the jungles of the Shan Hills so as to minimize these attacks on the imperial supply lines. A full army would now take on the pesky Gangto Fort once again, but now two larger armies would bypass Gangto and go down directly through the Iari on each bank of the river. The twin armies would be accompanied by a river flotilla manned by sailors of the Fujian Navy. To avoid a repeat of Mingri's mistake, Fu Hung was determined to guard his supply and communication lines, and advance at a slower, sustainable pace. He also brought in a full regiment of carpenters and engineers who would build fortresses and boats along the invasion route. Furthermore, Qing would wait until the monsoon season was over to prevent the disease from ravaging them again the full might of the Qing Empire will be brought down on the insulin Burmese and avenge its humiliations. But the Burmese too were at their greatest height. After the close call against Mingri's army, King Simbushin recalled all his forces from Siam and other fronts. It meant to abandon his Thai vessels and everything they had gained in the two year war. But there was very little choice in the matter. The survival of the kingdom was now at stake. The bulk of the Gongbao military was brought to face the Qing threat. The cream of the royal army would be sent to the front. Alongside the Burmese elite were the European regiments of musketeers and artillery under the command of Thiri Yazatu Jotin, a 
better known in the West as Pierre de Milard, a former French officer. Naval infantry regiments using warboats from Lower Burma were raised to support their northern brethren. Mon, Karen, Delta Bamar, and even Rakhine boatmen were recruited under the command of a prominent Mon general, Banya'a. The command of the best and brightest of Burma was given to Mahathi Hathura, the victor of the Manual campaign. When the Qing army of 50,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry left for Yunnan, the Burmese were ready. On the 21st of October, King Simbushin sent a force of 100 elephants, 1,200 cavalry and 12,000 infantry to Mogong while Mahathi Hathura took the bulk of the Burmese army through the river with his cavalry and elephants following via the banks. The royal force was joined by levies from local nobility and villages, many of them from the Shan states. Allah Mindin would retain command of Gaotong for the third time, a command he had held since the second invasion, and he was reinforced with more men, firearms, supplies, including European contingents as well as Kachin and Shan hunters. Unlike during Mingri's invasion, the Burmese were throwing everything they had against the Qing. Precise numbers are unknown, but after being reinforced by militia, levies from the vessel chieftains and regiments from Lower Burma, the Burmese army was likely to be under 40,000 strong with some 2,000 cavalry and a few hundred war elephants. Qing too seemed to be aware of the significantly strengthened Burmese defences, as Fu Hung decided not to wait until the monsoon season was over against the advice of many of his generals. It was a calculated gamble, as he wanted to strike before the Burmese arrived, but he had also hoped the malaria and the disease would not be everywhere. In October 1768, towards the end of the monsoon season, Fu Hung launched the largest invasion of the war. The three Qing armies jointly attacked and captured Bamo. They then proceeded south, building a massive fortification near the Xuanyangbin village, some 12 kilometers east of the Burmese fortress of Gamto. As planned, the carpenters and engineers duly built hundreds of war boats to sail down the Yavari. With the Burmese army still making their way north, Gaotong took the full blunt of the Qing invasion alone. Fearing another prolonged siege as it occurred in the previous invasions, the Qing launched a direct and frontal assault on Gaotong with overwhelming force from land and river. However, once again, Bala Mindin and the garrison proved themselves. The Burmese and European defenders held off gallant attempts by bannermen to storm the wall with musket fire, light artillery and boiling oil. For the third time in the war, Bala Mindin proved himself to be one of the finest officers of his age. The Qing losses were so heavy in the assault that they pulled back and focused only on bombarding the fort with artillery from land and river. The garrison suffered heavy casualties over the prolonged bombardment, but motivated by Bala Mindin's leadership, the Countdown garrison endured and continued to defy the Qing. Hearing of the attack on Gangton Fort, the Hathura ordered his naval flotilla made up of men from Lower Burma to sail up and reinforce the garrison. He then detached three separate armies to counter the Qing movements. Two armies were sent to harass and prevent the twin Qing armies from crossing the Iyawadi. A third force consisting of lightly equipped infantry and cavalry under Deng Jiaomingao was sent further north to cut the Qing supplies and lines of communications just as he did during the third invasion. The Hatura took the remaining forces to Gaotong, where he made camp on the western bank of the Iyawadi. The Burmese navy under the Mon commander Banya'a broke through the Qing blockade of Gaotong and managed to resupply and reinforce the Gaotong garrison. Banya'a then took 500 of his men and built a stockade behind enemy lines to harass the Qing army. However, when the Burmese fleet left, the Qing returned and repositioned itself. Meanwhile, the two Burmese armies sent to follow the Qing river force reached them. Despite arriving earlier, the Qing forces, being cautious of Burmese ambushes, moved too slowly, which allowed the two main armies to catch up to them. The Burmese armies, however, did not engage the Qing directly and instead built stockades along their position, including Momie and near the Xuanyangbin fortress, as well as along river forts and near the Eyawadi. The Qing army on the eastern bank suddenly found itself surrounded by Burmese stockades. Fearing an encirclement like at Mimyo, the Qing commander sent two of his forces of around 5,000 infantry and 500 cavalry each 
to find and engage the Burmese force at Momit and near the Xuanyangbin fortress before they could complete the fortifications. General Nemil Situ, who fought the Qing in the early stages of the war, commanded the force at Momie and left his stockade to meet the attackers. As the Qing army arrived, however, the Imperial Cavalry Column found itself charged by a large number of war elephants. The Bannerman Cavalry managed to retreat in good order before the elephants could reach them. As they prepared to counterattack, some 2,000 Burmese and European musketeers appeared from the jungle and fired on the horsemen. Under heavy musket fire and the charging elephants in sight, the Qing cavalry commander ordered a retreat. The infantry continued forward unsupported however, who were then attacked by the main Burmese force. Fierce fighting followed and the superior training of the bannermen proved themselves and they routed the Burmese force. The Burmese infantry retreated under covering fire of European musketeers and reformed behind makeshift defences. Qing forces pressed the Burmese hard. As the Qing victory was near, horns blared and the Burmese cavalry charged on both flanks of the Qing army. Bamar and Maniburi riders broke the Qing ranks with sword and lance, routing them with heavy losses. The other Qing force east of the Qing fortress at Xuanyangbin managed to avoid being ambushed and were able to engage the Burmese forces in the field. With shunned kitchen levies on the front, the Manchu Mongol cavalry charged forward, hoping to break the Burmese before they could form up properly. However, Pierre de Milad's European musketeers stepped forward and unleashed a devastating volley that broke the Qing charge. The Burmese then counterattacked, broke the disorganized Qing, routing them back into the stockade. As the Qing retreated into the safety of the fortress, the pursuing Burmese soldiers were startled by the sheer size of the fortress, describing it as big as a city. As Fu Heng adjusts his plans against these new developments, and Mahathihatura rushed forward with the rest of the Burmese army, one Qing commander will make the decision that would seal the fate of the entire expedition. Join us again next time as the war intensifies and one Burmese general would make a sacrifice.